237, all right. Welcome to Sunday evening worship. Keith, do you not take a shower? You're the only one on that side. Everybody else is over here. <laughs> I, I'm with you. That, that is true. That is true. Now we've got to start judging. All right. Welcome to Sunday evening worship. So thankful everybody's here. Um, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this beautiful day, God. Thank you for this opportunity to come together. Thank you for the folks that are here, God. I just pray that as we leave this place, that we're just going out and being the light in the world that you call us to be. God, many times in the Bible we see where it says to hold fast, stand fast, hold until the end. And so God, help each and every one of us to be that conqueror that holds to the end, that keeps your word, that abides by your word, and shares your word as you command us. So God, just be with us again this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to sing 237, 237 in your hymn book. Oh, there you go, Richard's joining you. So 237, I stand amazed in the presence. All right, so we've just got a few announcements. We have the revival coming up that starts next Sunday evening. It'll be kicked off from Grant Hill Missionary Baptist Church and their uh, Herbert Johnson and their choir. So I uh, look forward to seeing, and their musicians, I uh, look forward to seeing as many folks there. So the revival will be Sunday evening at 6 and then the rest of the week till Wednesday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be at 7 o'clock. And uh, Monday night will be Paul Atkinson, and he will be bringing the message, and Miss Kimberly Newsom will be leading worship that evening. And then uh, Tuesday is Daryl Gaddy with Nicole Craft and crew doing worship on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, um, it will wrap it up with Reverend Donald Duncan, and we'll have Brian Sargent and the crew from Free Will Baptist um, in to do worship. I want to kick off. Uh, and back to school bash will be Sunday, September 4th at 530. Did we get the okay? All right. So it's going to be held at David Nesbitt's pool and slash pool house. So um, I'm sure there'll be more information to come hopefully by next week. 
Carrie Ann? All right. More information to come next week so we can get that out there. But uh, Sunday, September 4th at 5.30 at uh, Mr. David Nesbitt's house as he's given us free reign of the pool and the pool house. The only, Carrie Ann, the only thing is everybody, when they leave, they have to take a cat. Yeah, they have to take a cat. He's trying to help Myra get rid of him. But uh, <laughs> I knew you'd like that one. Yes, we'll need boxes. Yes, sir. So, uh, but thank you, David, and let your wife know thank you for allowing us uh, to use that. And then in September, we have uh, the new church year, and then again, the Iwana kickoff. But we also have the week of prayer that will be on the four- Wednesday the 14th, correct? No, we verified. We verified. It's that next week. We didn't change it. We didn't change anything. That's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I go off of what my secretary tells me, the executive assistant. But uh, Wednesday the 14th is when the week of prayer will be, and then we'll be getting um, funds for Janie Chapman, which I believe that's what the week of prayer is, right? I always forget them. All right, Janie Chapman. So we have that coming up in September as well. The first Tuesday in September, we have Men's Fellowship, uh, 7 o'clock. All men are invited. And then we have uh, Dicey Gibbons is the second Tuesday at 530 in the Fellowship Hall uh, down the way. So all women, please attend that. Is there any other announcements that I'm forgetting about? All right. So that's... That's what we got for announcements. So tonight, if you have your Bibles, if you wouldn't mind, please turning over to uh, Revelations. Wow, starts with an R. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and uh, we're going to be in verse 37. And tonight, God laid on my heart to talk about conquerors, what it means to be a conqueror. Because ultimately, we know in the New Testament that it's talked about many times about Remain till the end, steadfast. Um, We see now there's a bunch falling off, as is promised in the Bible. Uh, So it's all about us being conquerors. Now, we're not conquerors because of who we are. We're conquerors because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the only way that we can remain steadfast till the end. And so what we're looking at here is how to, uh, what are ways that we can do that? How do we conquer? What does conquering look like? So in Romans, and in Paul's letter to the Roman church, chapter 8, verse 37, it says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So again, the only way that we can be considered conquerors, the only way we're going to remain steadfast till the end, the only way that we're going to be able to remain um, what God wants us to be in the face of all that is changing, in the face of society telling us that we are wrong, the only way we're going to be able to do that is through God. And so the first way that we can that we know that we can do that is with more prayer. Right? Throughout the Bible we're talked about the importance of prayer. The disciples knew how important prayer was because they went to Jesus and said teach us how to pray. So that's where we get the Lord's prayer but we conquer it um, we we become conquerors with more prayer. We've said it a lot of times, right? Especially with COVID and everything that's going on. You know, I've heard a lot of um, people that are a lot smarter than me saying, you know, God is trying to get his children to humble themselves and to pray, right? Pray for this country, pray for the lost. And so we can become conquerors with more prayer. Philippians 4, 6 tells us, but in everything by prayer, let your requests be made known unto God. See, there's a lot of us that, really um, lack victory in our lives. We lack discernment in our lives because we neglect to pray. I know there's a lot of times when things seem foggy to me, when I'm struggling to to find an answer for, for whatever it is, and then I'm like, well, when was the last time I asked God what he wanted me to do? When was the last time I went to God and said, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this. How do I deal with it? But what I do is I get into that, that rut of struggling with whatever it is, and I'm not looking for the victory in the sense that God wants me to look for it. I'm looking for the, I just want to get out of this situation. 
I just want to get over whatever this is. And I don't care how it happens. So there's no victory because I failed to go to God. Or, better yet, one of the things that uh, I struggle with, especially as a young man when I first got saved, is that I prayed about big things, right? Save the world. Feed all the people that are starving, which is very important, right? We want that. Save all that are lost, you know? Um, We want that, but we neglect and we forget to pray about the little things. We forget to pray about the little things. And we know that it's a lot of times it's a bunch of little things stacked up. They're going to mess up the big things regardless of how much we may pray about it. And we know this, Songs of Solomon in in chapter 2, verse 15 says, the little foxes that spoil the vines. See, a lot of times we forget about those little foxes because they're not that big of a deal by themselves. But you keep stacking up the little foxes and little foxes keep coming and they keep eating your rabbits, they keep eating your, 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 uh, your vegetables, they keep eating your garden, and the next thing you know, you've got no food right? It's the little things. So a lot of times in our prayer life, we need to, we need to start focusing, or not a lot of times, but what we would need to do is we need to start focusing on the smaller issues. The smaller issues. Because I think, well, it doesn't matter what I think. What I know in my life is that any time that I've had to deal with something that is, that is big, I could always pinpoint it down to a simple issue or a simple thing. If I really sat down and thought about it, what did I do Or what has been done that caused this? And then I start praying that A, I don't do that again. Or B, I don't put myself in that situation again. You get what I'm saying? So we have to remember not just to pray for the big things. Those are important too. But don't forget we need to pray for the small things. We need to pray for the small things. And we we could take that from, you know, praying for all that are lost in the world to maybe just praying for your neighbor who's lost. Maybe praying for that one family that has nothing. What we can do to maybe, you know, help them or how God can lead us to help them. But pray for the small things. And see, if we're to become conquerors, if we're to to remain steadfast, or if we're to remain to the end, if we're thinking about prayer, we do have to pray about everything, both the small and the great. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 is to pray without ceasing. I think it's funny that Paul doesn't tell us what to pray for. He just says pray all the time. Don't quit. Keep praying. And so while we focus on the smaller things that are truly affecting our lives, we also need to focus on the, the other things, and we need to pray about them continually. Not just once or twice and then give up. Or not just once or twice and say, okay, God, you didn't answer that one. So let me move on to the next one. We are to pray without ceasing. The Old Testament, Abraham, is a perfect example of what that looks like. Now, we could say he was bartering with God to save uh, Sodom, right? Because he was saying, hey, if there's just this many, if there's just this many, if there's just this many, that's what that looks like. Don't quit praying. Don't quit talking to God, especially if you have something on your heart or especially if you're dealing with something big in your life. Because God wants to hear from you. We have to pray. And as I talked a little bit about this morning, as we talked about promises, but we can conquer because we know what his promises are. We know what he promises us in the scripture. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. See, this is kind of, uh, I thought this was kind of unique when I was looking at it. But this goes with the message this morning in the sense that, you know, we falter a lot of times when we're reading or remembering or trying to rely on God's promises, what they were, because we forget all that and we we rely on our own strength. We start leaning on our own understanding, right? Right? Again, God, I'm going to put you on the shelf because I'm going to deal with this situation. And then when I need your help again, I'll just pull you off the shelf. That's not what God wants. That's not who God is. That's not how we are supposed to treat God, the God that saved us. We are supposed to depend on him and we're supposed to rely on his promises. You know, we talked about faith this morning. 
We only have to have faith of a mustard seed to move a mountain. We don't have to have this grandiose faith. The faith of a mustard seed. We know how big a mustard seed is. We know how big a mustard seed is. But we have to quit relying on our own strength because here's what happens. You end up breaking down. Whether it's through a nervous breakdown, it's a physical breakdown. But anytime we try to get through something on our own, we normally cause ourselves more stress. We cause ourselves more anxiety. Uh, the thing that is called depression can hit us because why can't I get out of this? I'm so much smarter than this. Why did I do this? You notice the focus is on us, not God. God, I am weak. God, I need you. God, I know you've promised you'll never leave me nor forsake me, but I feel like I am left right now. I need you. Something along those lines. So we are supposed to conquer, but we conquer because we know that he promises and we know that he follows through on his promises. In 1 Kings 8, 56 says, There hath not failed one word of all his good promises. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise. What that's telling us is that God has never failed on any of his promises. And that was up to that point. We have a whole bunch more books after that that shows God fulfills his promises. The greatest promise he fulfilled was when Jesus Christ came on this earth, was born a virgin, lived a perfect 33 and a half years. And then he was tormented, he was tortured, he was uh, spit on, he was slapped, he was hung on a cross, he died, he was put into a tomb, he was buried, and then he rose again on the third day. We read about a little bit about that this morning in Isaiah, but there's more than just Isaiah that prophesied about the coming Messiah. And so God promised that, and God's promises come true. He does not fail us. And there is not a promise that he he has made that he will not bring about to fruition. And then I'll tell you, this third one is, is the one that I really struggle with. I really struggle with it. I spend a lot of time thinking, if you can't tell, and I listen to podcasts, listen to other people that are smarter than me, listen to other sermons, other people that preach, but there's this thing that's called peace, and for a lot of years in the military, you know, we were trained as firemen, and even when we would go into different situations, the the military trained us to be uh, not necessarily um, do our best in peace, but we did our best in chaos. As firefighters, your worst day was our best day because we got to use what they trained us to do. We got to go and be heroes. So we started thriving on chaos. The more chaos, the calmer I seemed to become. The more chaos, the better I became because I could control all of this. I knew how to deal with all of this. I was more at peace in that chaos, but that's not the peace that we're talking about in here. And so I have to be very careful because what happens is anytime I feel like I'm not in control, I create chaos so that I can regain control. Does that make sense to anybody? I create chaos so I can control. Now understand, I'm really not in control, but that's the way my brain was built, and that's the, way my, that's the way my body was taught, and that's how I was trained to be. Anytime I was not in control, create chaos so that I can regain control. Or run into that chaos so I can bring about control. And then at the end of it, you get the pats on the back, the thank yous, the adrenaline rush, you know, all that great stuff. I'm telling you, there is no drug that is better out there than the adrenaline you get after a near-death experience. That's why you get a lot of veterans, you get a lot of those folks, cops, who that retire, they get injured on duty, and then they come out of the Air Force, or or Air Force, they come out of whatever that is, and they go to the bottle. They go to a drug because they're looking for that high, that adrenaline high again, because there's nothing else in the world like that high of being in a near-death experience, surviving it, and slapping your buddy next to you and saying, wow, how did we make it out of that? But this peace that God is talking about is the peace that surpasses all understanding. Seeing the chaos, not understanding the chaos, and being at peace, that there may not be anything you can do about that chaos. There's not any answers that you can give about that chaos. You can't look at that mother and say, 
I know why your baby passed, or I know why you had that miscarriage. Because we don't. I don't. It's being able to be at peace to know that there's a plan and there's a greater there's a greater being in God who knows why whatever has happened has happened. And I don't have to come in and try and control it. I have peace because he is in control. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds. See, if we're to become conquerors, we have to forget what we think we know about peace. And we have to see what the peace of God looks like. The peace of God is being able to say, God, my life is really not that fun right now. God, I am hurting. God, why am I going through this medical situation? And while I'm asking you why, I understand that you know. And that's enough for me. I can have peace. Because no matter what happens, I know that you've got me. Whether I'm healed as Paul, remember when Paul was writing to, the, to, to, the, to the one of the churches, he said, if I live, then I live and I get to serve God more. But if I die, then I get to go be in heaven with him. So he really wasn't faced with two bad situations, even though Paul would have preferred dying and going to heaven and being with the Savior. See, we sometimes fail to be victorious because we lack the peace that comes only from God. We thrive in chaos so much that that's just our world, and we don't see it as chaos. People come up and be like, man, your life's kind of a mess. I I love it. My life's perfect. But that's not the peace. That's not how God would want us to live our life. See, we live with fear and doubts rather than with faith and confidence. We live with fear and doubts rather than faith and confidence. The only way that we can become conquerors is if we partake of God's peace. If we are to take that verse that says the peace that surpasses all understanding, and if we take that and say, okay, I don't have to understand God to be at peace. I don't have to know every answer to be at peace. I don't have to know why this person did that to this other person to be at peace. I just have to know you. I have to have faith in you. I have to have faith in your promises. I have to have faith in your word when it says that you know what's going on. You are the perfecter of our faith. You you have a greater good for everything and anything. And it's weird saying that, right? Because when you say that, it's like, well, so this happened. You allowed this to happen because of this. So this could happen. And sometimes the reality of that answer is yes. And sometimes the reality of that answer is no, it's sinful human beings making sinful decisions and God's going to clean it up. But he is sovereign and he knows how to do that. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, "May may peace I give unto you, let not your heart be troubled. Now here's the beauty of it. Here's the beauty of Jesus. Here's the beauty of God the Father. Just like with salvation, all we have to do to get it is accept it. We can get his peace. We just have to accept it. We just have to say, all right, God, I want that peace. I want to live out that peace. I want people to see that peace in me. That way, when this world is falling apart and I'm still over here praising you, people are going to come and want to know why I can be the way I am. They want to know why and how I can be as happy as I am, even though this may have happened to me or someone in my family. It's not always easy, and I get that. But we, we, we serve a father who is way more powerful than we are. But see, when you become Christians, he takes some of that and gives it to you. You know what that's called? The Holy Spirit. And so this evening, if, if we're going to remain steadfast, if we're going to be, be the conquerors that God calls us to be in his word, then we must pray more. We have to pray about the small things. God wants to hear about it. And we must continue to pray. Pray without ceasing as we read in the uh, First Thessalonians. Then we have to rely on his promises because that's all we've got. But to me, it's much easier to to rely on his promises and to believe his promises when we see how many have come to fruition 
than any man's. And then we have to have his peace. We have to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. We have to know what that is. We have to know what that looks like. We have to know what that means for our life. How do we live in that peace? How do we live in, in, in that faith and confidence rather than our fear and our doubts? How do we do that? What does that look like? To me, this is just a cycle because then I'm going to go back to more prayer when I'm struggling with that, when I'm having fear and doubts. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get into the word, and I want to find out why. What am I struggling with, God? Show me. Help me to discern what you want me to do in this situation. Because sometimes, as we uh, read this morning, it's to be still. Sometimes it may be you need to equip yourself with the full armor of God and get to fighting. But the only way we're going to know what that looks like for us is if we're praying, if we're in his word, if we're believing in his promises, and if we live out his peace. When we live out his peace, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you show us in your word. We thank you for the promises that you have made and that you uh, brought about to show us that you are a man, a being of your word, God, that you just are not blowing smoke or you're not trying to sell us a used car, God, that this is something that's real and this is something that's applicable and this is something that means so much more than just our life here on this earth. It means our eternity. And so God, help us this evening to pray more. God, help us to focus on the, the little things and they're not really little. They're, they're just things that do affect us almost every day, if not every day. Help us to continue to pray for the missionaries. Help us to continue to pray for our military. Help us to continue to pray for, for the lost of the world, God, and for the, those that are starving and those that need this or need that, God. But help us also to focus right here in Turbyville. Help us to focus in our little sphere of influence. And God, just help us in general. Give us your peace. Help us to look at things through your eyes and not seeing things as world enders or life enders, God. But, you know, just help us to be thankful and joyful at all times. As sinners, we're not going to be perfect at that, God, and you know that. And I thank you for loving us in spite of all of that. All of our sinfulness and all of our just wicked ways. So God, continue to be with us this evening. Be with us the rest of this week as we go about our jobs and our lives. God, send someone across each and every one of our paths that we can share the gospel too. Whether they're they're fallen back, they're, they're saved, but they, they just lost their way or they're lost, God, and they've never uh, got to meet Jesus at the cross and have their wife or their life washed clean. So God, just be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Who do we, do we have any prayer requests? We got, we had some unspokens this morning. Um, the revival coming up, the new year for the um, church. And then some other folks that are sick in the hospital, not doing so hot. Are there any other prayer requests we haven't mentioned that need to be added to the list? All right, any praises? Amen. That's what he said. And then he goes back in a month and may get another one. That's what I'm talking about. I want to be there, though, because I'll be needing that someday. I just want to see when he says that last one's going to, what did he say, going to hit you? The, the sixth time? Yeah. All right. Any others? All right, Brad, you mind close us out in prayer, sir?